I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. You know, one in five people in America have medical debts. They can't pay it back. They're trying to pay it back. It's the leading cause of bankruptcy in America is health care costs. I think we spent over $2 trillion in healthcare costs uh, last year. 3.5. 3.5 trillion. Still, why in hospitals? They can't make the gown long enough to cover the back of someone. <laughs> like, can't they figure that out with $3.5 trillion? All right. That aside, it's the leading cause of bankruptcy in America. Well, you want to take a step back a lot of times and just be like, what are we doing? What are we, we, people coming in obese and we're telling them the wrong thing. We're telling them to avoid fat. That's, that's been disproven, right? It's not true. It's, we move them into these high carbohydrate diets and it, the, the obesity is sugar addiction. And a lot of bad health is from inflammation and a lot of it is carb driven. We've been telling people the wrong thing. We're doing it today. We do it. And you realize that there's another way of doing things that's better, but medicine has been closed to it. The reality is we're not great at humility in medicine. We're not great at, I don't know. We're not great at, see my partner because they have more experience. Is that because of the legal ramifications also? No, I think it's the individualism that we promote in medical school. It's competitive. There's a bias towards uh, competitiveness, individualism, and performance. And so, 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 you know, how can I protect myself? And this, this is really going between both books now. So unaccountable and the price we pay. Well, what are hospitals not telling me that I should know to protect myself both on pricing and appropriate care? And then what's the role of nutrition and wellness in all of this? Yeah. Uh, I just asked you pretty massive questions. Just how do we fix the healthcare system? Write a third book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? This is going to be an excellent episode. Pay close attention because... We're going to learn everything that hospitals and doctors are afraid to tell you and what you can do about it. And we're also going to explore how the entire healthcare system can be improved. I got with me today, uh, Dr. Marty McCary. Uh, he's surgeon, uh, professor of health policy at Johns Hopkins. He's the author of the book, Unaccountable. And the subtitle is, uh, What Hospitals Won't Tell You and How Transparency Can Revolutionize Healthcare. And then he's also, most recently, coming out in September, author of the book, The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. And I also should mention this book, Unaccountable, became a TV show, The Resident. <laughs> so before we talk about anything, just like, how does that happen? Did like, 
I don't know, Steven Spielberg call you up and say, Marty, <laughs> come to Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, I got a call from Antoine Fuqua's uh, production team and they said, hey, we, we want to make this book a TV show. Can you come out to LA with your agent? And I said, I, yeah, sure, of course. I have no agent. So you're, I was you're, like, what? just by the way, when someone asks a question like that, who do they think you are? <laughs> exactly. Like, like, does he think everybody like carries around an agent with them? Yeah, like, I'm like holding pressure in the hospital here on somebody's, you know, hemorrhage. And it's like, <laughs> what you want me to do? What? You know, and I'm not like, maybe they've been in Hollywood so long. They think everybody in the country has an agent, <laughs> but like, it seems like a weird question, like an, uh, like an intelligence test kind of question. Like these sorts of people do not have agents. These sorts do. And the likelihood is using your big short analogy from the price we pay, the likelihood is you do not have a television agent. <laughs> it's a it's a weird question and it's a weird world over there in Hollywood. So I've learned a little bit about it. And and did you have to go around like pitching or did they say, look, we're just gonna buy this idea from you. We'll take it from here. Yeah, the latter. They just wanted to run with it. And do you, do you benefit as seasons get renewed and things like that? I wish I did. If I had you as my agent, I'd be doing a lot better, James. Yeah, like why didn't you get like a little bit of, like a producer credit, a little bit of ownership? Yeah. Uh, on the idea. Go talk to Fox a little bit because uh, the show's crushing it right now. It's the number one medical drama on television. They ran with some of the characters uh, from the book Unaccountable, but it's it's good to see people critically look at the business of medicine and not just the drama of taking care of patients. And that's what the show The Resident has done. Again, I'm thinking of a popular medical show where the doctor turned writer made probably... 200 million from it, Michael Crichton and ER as an ex uh, another example of this. Oh, he's a whole different league. I mean, I, I, I think Michael Crichton's one of the most gifted writers in medicine, and I love the creative medical students that want to do stuff like that because medicine kind of beats the creativity out of people. And Crichton, I, I mean, I loved ER. I watched that show throughout medical school. I learned from it. So I think there's no comparison between, you know, me and the TV show, The Resident, and Michael Crichton. No, I'm, I'm making the comparison. I think you should have made more money. But okay, we'll move on from that. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the price we pay. I think it's so important. I think, you know, the you know one one in five uh, people in America have like medical debt they can't pay it back they're trying to pay it back it's the leading cause of bankruptcy in America is healthcare costs I forget the exact number we pay I think we spent over two trillion dollars in healthcare costs uh, last year three point five three point five okay so I'm I'm out of date and and three point five trillion still why in the hospitals they can't make the gown long enough to cover the back of someone like can't they figure that out with three and a half trillion dollars all right that aside it's the leading cause of bankruptcy in america <laughs> there's a doctor at cornell who when he found out that medical students or residents were going to get long coats instead of the short coats that students wear he had his coat extended he was so pissed off and he wore this like train like a bride you know around the hospital and it would like mop the floors behind him and it's just kind of this this hierarchy of, of medicine has hurt us. You know, well, well, and I think this is is a, uh, really what both books are about, is this kind of like personal thinking at the physician level and all the kind of politics and personal issues and, and so many things. I mean, I could kind of repeat all the stuff you talk about on Unaccountable, but maybe we should start with you. What What... What caused you to to write this? And and your background is kind of varied. You didn't you didn't you dropped out of medical school initially. Like what what happened? Well, I felt dis disillusioned after my third year. I just felt like we're not talking about the key issues that produce health in America. And so I found this really attractive program at the Harvard School of Public Health to to study deeper issues. And I, I really wanted to work with the folks there. So. Um, I think I dropped out in a good way, if we can say, in the sense that I followed another interest. And then eventually I just missed the bedside care so much. My dad was a cancer doctor. I wanted to get back into it. I really got some great mentors who were surgeons at Harvard. And so uh, it ended up working out great where I got the public health education and the very bedside surgical education, which was a nice compliment. Sure, sure. and without both of those, you probably wouldn't have been able to write these books and have the analytical 
uh, view towards these situations. Well, you want to take a step back a lot of times and just be like, what are we doing? What are we, we, people coming in obese and we're telling them the wrong thing. We're telling them to avoid fat. That's, that's been disproven, right? It's not true. It's, we move them into these high carbohydrate diets and it, the, the obesity is sugar addiction. And a lot of bad health is from inflammation and a lot of it is carb driven. We're, t- we've been telling people the wrong thing. We're doing it today. We do it. And you realize that there's another way of doing things that's better, but medicine has been closed to it. We've said, oh, you think that meditation may be good good to treat hypertension? There's no randomized controlled trial, and therefore there's no evidence, therefore it's not true. And there's been this sort of closed Eastern, you know, sort of concept of we, we don't want to hear any of it. And the reality is the young docs and students today, they want to know how yoga affects things. They want to know about food as treatment. Do, do they? Because they're... Uh, student loans plus their insurance costs <laughs> right. have driven their anxiety levels up themselves to the point where they must be concerned with what you call, call out as a major problem in both books that, uh, you know, they're encouraged to, pro- sometimes the worse a doctor is, the more money he makes because he can prescribe procedure after procedure, fixing the older, the procedures where he messed up. So... <laughs> Well, you know, when we, when, if you were to walk through, James, with me, the Ross building where the pre-med students are interviewing for the Johns Hopkins Medical School, and you talk to these kids, they are the most bright, creative, altruistic, mission-minded, social justice determined individuals you'll ever meet. And they're dressed perfectly and they're excited and they're smiling. And then we take those creative kids and we beat them down with this memorization and regurgitation and this sort of you know learning stuff that they don't need to learn. They don't need to memorize the Krebs cycle and every intermediary by name. You don't have to do that in the trauma. What is the Krebs break. cycle? It's this pathway that goes on inside. It's a biochemical pathway, and we force everyone to memorize every name of intermediate molecules, you know, five different times in their medical education. What are we doing? There's an internet nowadays. So my, my passion and what I love doing is taking medical students, like we've got Sarah Beth here right now. We've got these medical students who are highly creative. They want to do cool stuff, and I want to keep that flame lit. I want to encourage them. I want them to push the field of medicine. I want them to ask questions and to challenge things and to look at the medical establishment and say, maybe there's another perspective. Maybe well, talk. Let, let me ask you this then, because and so we'll start with the, the education of doctors. I think you mentioned in this book, education can be cut probably by about 20%, uh, uh, which seems like a lot. Like, I don't even know. There's so many different things. There's the education, then there's <laughs> residencies. Inter- I don't even know. What are all the things? You're an intern, you're a resident, you're a student. Like, what? how long does it take to become a doctor? You're a prince, you're a king. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a decade. And we would take people for a decade. In my case, let's say I do... Um, pancreas islet transplant procedures and, and surgical oncology or cancer surgery, mostly pancreatic cancer work. It's about 14 years of training. Now, when people come out and we try to educate them about the business of medicine, the stuff from the, the price we pay, sometimes we hear this, oh, I, you know, I don't have time to learn that. Okay, you studied for 14 years. You don't have time to learn this or a new way of doing that operation, minimally invasive or the latest research that shows women with stage one breast cancer sometimes don't need chemo if they have a certain gene test come back positive. They need to learn that stuff, right? This is staying up to date. Now, most doctors do the right thing and always try to. Doctors have incredible hearts, but we take these creative kids and we you know, beat them down and they come out a decade or two decades later entitled, pissed off, they feel like they've got to cheat the system because the system's cheated them with Medicare reimbursement rates being low. And we wonder why physician burnout rates are at an all-time high. It's the treadmill, right? It's the soul, I believe, deeply yearns for a sense of purpose in life in any profession to contribute, to help. And when you take that away from the very profession of, of caring for people, um, people are frustrated and disillusioned. I felt it a little bit in my third year of medical school. Luckily, you know, I got a second wind and I love what I do with bedside care. 
But the bigger issues in healthcare right now are exciting to me because a quarter of patients don't trust us and they avoid care because of fear of medical price gouging or the treatment is inappropriate. So if we can get at these two root causes, and that's what I, I I love the movie, The Big Short, because it identified the root issues in a way anybody could understand. Right, so as as an example, so the the Big Short, um, you know, uh, analyzed the the roots of the financial crisis in 2008. And I remember at the time uh, I was in the hedge fund business and I met with John Paulson, who's discussed in the book, but not the movie, he was the biggest guy who bet against the housing crisis. And I remember he presented to me, this is in 2006, so it was way before the financial crisis actually started, but he presented to me, this is what's going to happen. And and he says, I don't know when it's going to happen. So until it happens, I'm gonna be down 1% a month. And so I couldn't invest with him. I didn't want to be down 1% a month. And I called every other hedge fund and they said, oh, he's ridiculous. Don't listen to him. <laughs> and his trade is already too crowded. It's never going to happen. Uh, meaning once people realize this, the reverse will happen instead of what everybody expects. But I remember he laid it out so thoroughly about how the financial system is going to collapse. And his final words to me was, were, my, my only worry is that the banks are going to collapse before I take my money out. <laughs> and I remember my associate and I left and my associate was like, man, we're screwed as like a society. And then I didn't think about it again until we were screwed as a society. <laughs> but <laughs> you were he was right, right there. You were right there. So, but the thing is you make the point now, this is not as, this is not as kind of, there's no financial derivatives on healthcare the same way there was with mortgages, but the reality is people, not banks, people need a bailout. Like people are going bankrupt because of healthcare costs and they're spiraling upwards without healthcare maybe improving as much as the costs are improving. And the mirage of the financial crisis, the way it got so bad is that the ex so-called experts, the geniuses out there said, oh, it's so complex, you have to leave it to us, we're the experts. And in medicine, there's this mirage that it's so complex, you've got to leave it to us. We know what we're doing. We're fighting for you. And there's a blame game going on, right? They're blaming uh, uh, pharma and PBMs and hospitals and docs. And, and the blame game is so big. The reality is there are two underlying root problems in medicine that account for our modern day cost crisis that is crushing everyday hardworking Americans and businesses. And the reason businesses are fleeing in the United States. And those root to, two root causes are inappropriate care, and number two, pricing failures. And they're very simple to understand. And in the book, The Price We Pay, I try to present those in the examples and the scenarios that people encounter them and face them and that are fixable. And because the subject can be depressing, and I don't like depression, I try to offer a an innovator who's bucking the system or disrupting in some positive way. And in the end, I'm very optimistic about the future of medicine. Well, I mean... Hopefully that's true because uh, playing the devil's advocate just for a second, obviously there's innovation in medical technology. There's, we're getting faster and faster at doing things like sequencing the genome, doing robotic surgery. Uh, you know, AI is going to play a bigger and bigger role. So hopefully that solves some of these problems, but it sounds like because the system is fractured, it's going to have a hard time getting new solutions in there. So let's talk about like pricing failures first. And then, and then also I want to get to the, what hospitals won't tell you <laughs> thing too, because I'm obsessed with that. But what's, what are the, the two things, pricing failures? And what was the other one? Inappropriate care. So if we look at say pricing failures, for example, would it make sense to go to a restaurant and ask for a menu and then be told, oh, who's your employer? Oh, you get this menu where the prices are five times higher. And so this ridiculous game that's- Does that happen? It, it happens all the time. Like, People can you give go me an in, example? So like, you go to, uh, uh, on Vail Mountain, you're skiing. Yeah, there's no poor people skiing on Vail Mountain unless they're you know, co college kids on their parents' health insurance plan. And you go to the local hospital, you have a little altitude sickness, you get a $10,000 bill. Okay, that's price gouging in the market. Now hospitals will say, oh, we have so many uninsured people, we have to compensate for the care. On Vail Mountain, you have uninsured people. So, 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 so obviously they know that because the the hospital 
understands the demographic of the area. 98% of their quote unquote customers slash patients can write the check. They don't need insurance for to write it. Uh, so and then they, on the one hand, I would say that's unfair, but on the one, on the other hand, I'm not concerned that much about the people in Vail. I'm more concerned <laughs> about the people, let's say in Harlem or whatever. Yeah, uh, yep. are well, they getting gouged? Well, they're getting the same phenomena as happening there, right? So you take, for example, the, the, this, these egregious sticker prices, when we present them to hospital CEOs, what do hospitals universally say? They say, oh, well, nobody pays those prices. It's just the sticker price. Almost everybody gets a discount through their insurance. Well, guess what? Out-of-network care at in-network hospitals, that's the fastest-growing group of patients in America. The uninsured still get hammered with those sticker prices. The Amish, faith-based co-ops, all sorts of folks in America now, high-deductible insurance plans. So, so, so I'm trying to understand each thing because um, I don't know from, from personal experience. So uh, you're saying someone goes in, what's out of network in, what was the phrase you used? Out of, network. out of network care. So you go to the emergency room and the emergency room doctor is out of network, out of your insurance network, even though the hospital is in the network, a, a sort of, you know, um, is he billing you or is the hospital billing both you? Both are billing you and they're both billing you. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're both billing you. And now you've got private equity comes along, buys tens of thousands of doctors' pra you know, practices. Now they control the billing. They're buying the practices where you don't have a choice. Emergency room doctors, anesthesiologists. Do you get to pick your anesthesiologist? No. Um, pathologists, um, radiologists, anest you know, neonatologists. So, so you're saying when I go, let's say I'm rushed into the hospital, I need surgery, uh, I'm conscious, but I, well, I wouldn't even want to pick my anesthesiologist. I would want to just trust the hospital to pick the right one for me. I don't know. I don't have like the baseball cards of the anesthesiologist. I don't know who to pick. So I, I would trust them. Are they? Are you saying they're giving me ones that I wouldn't pick no, necessarily? Well, they're, all we're saying is that your insurance company has cut a deal with the hospital saying that we have a special deal where the insurance your insurance company is going to pay for your care because that this is one of their designated hospitals. But then these the the care there is not in that insurance network, and you get stuck with the bill directly. So the lab, the cash insurance can, won't pay for that. Insurance won't pay for it, and then you're stuck with the bill. And right now, Americans are getting hammered with these surprise bills. So this this is completely new information to me. So again, I'm and I'm sorry I'm repeating the question. Is uh, the doc? I always thought people get a bill from the hospital and that covers all the care. But you're saying the doctor sometimes there are integrated health systems hospitals that employ their doctors, but most places in America now. The doctors are out of network. The labs are out of network. So they take a shift. Like the, it's almost like a, a comedy club. The comedy club calls out to comedians, hey, who's available for this night? You're saying hospital calls out to all the medical practices in the area and says, what doctors can do a shift here? Or Yeah, they literally hire private groups to staff their hospitals. Oh, I didn't know that. And so that's a very common practice. And these private equity groups, publicly traded companies as well, by these mass groups of doctors, make sure all that billing is out of network. It's not just doctors. And the doctors, by the way, detest it who are in the group. They don't know what's happening. Their practice got bought. And now the patients are coming screaming, air ambulance. And do they, do they get paid, the doctors usually? Like if I, like, like I could imagine most people are just gonna say, oh, I'm not gonna pay this guy. I paid the hospital, I'm not gonna pay him. Well, good luck. You're gonna go to collections, sometimes go to court. In the, in the book, The Price We Pay, we found patients taken to court to have their wages garnished. I mean, that violates everything sacred about medicine. What will doctors usually, once you go to court, I imagine many settle, what will they usually settle for? How many cents on the dollar and what's owed? So me and my medical students go to court with these patients and we've been studying it, documenting and offering free medical uh, uh, pro bono expertise. And I'm the expert and I, and I tell the judges, they don't know the, this bill. I can't mow your lawn and charge you $50,000. And every case that we explain, or every case now where my name is on the case, the hospitals cancel the bill. But otherwise, they're you know just ruining the lives of these people, garnishing their paychecks. And people make 15 bucks an hour, and they're garnishing that paycheck until the person doesn't work anymore. So, th so this is with the out of network. What what what's what's another? So also not just out of network, but the way insurance has managed the high cost of healthcare in, in the United States. 
is to say, okay, we're going to increase the deductible or your share. So you've got to pay the first 5000 or 10000 for a year. The average deductible in the United States now for a bronze plan on the exchange is $5,900. So, so again, um, just, just the reason I'm asking so many stupid questions, I have not been to a doctor myself Good. Si since I was about 16 years old. <laughs> well, now, I've been, little, that's I've been to gap. hospitals when... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, you want me to check you out afterwards? <laughs> I think I think it's not because I'm so healthy. I think it is because I'm a hypochondriac, <laughs> and actually I'm worried I'm sick. But that's another story. But uh, I have been to hospitals, but not as much. And I've seen ups and downs and all sorts of things, but not related to my own healthcare. So I'm just trying to understand all these issues that you bring up. Yeah. So the insurance companies have they've been getting these high bills from doctors and from hospitals and labs and everybody. And so they've just said, hey, we're going to redesign insurance so that you pay the first five or $10,000. So That's if I the, go to the hospital with a, a, a pneumonia, yeah. uh, insurance won't pay for that? If I, and by the way, I don't have insurance, so I have no idea. <laughs> so the insurance... It, insu One of these friends are going to call me when you get sick saying, look, I don't have insurance. <laughs> look, um, so here's how it works. So the first, um, the bill, you're going to have to pay that bill up to five or ten thousand dollars if your deductible is five or ten thousand dollars. Are they that high people, for like something as simple as the cold or, or pneumonia? Yeah, it's for any healthcare spend. It's an annual deductible. So um, now the average deductible in the United States is around two thousand dollars for for basic care. Basic, but it, let's say you make forty thousand dollars a year. You're not buying the gold-plated Cadillac health plans. You're buying the ones with the high deductibles. And so when you get that bill, when you take your kid in for you know asthma treatment, a mom is coming to me saying, hey, I was just worried they had an asthma attack, and now I got a $6,000 bill. I have to cover it even though I have insurance because my deductible is $10,000. So everyday Americans are getting hammered, and that's why the phone is ringing off the hook in Congress right now, and healthcare is positioned to be the number one issue in the next presidential election. So, so, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think the last time I had insurance might've been when I was like a college student and there was like a college plan <laughs> and deductibles were like $20 or $50. Yeah, right. Is it that they've risen that much yes. or that I just had a bad plan one way or the other? Yeah, they've risen. So the, the health insurance companies say, oh, we're going to design you, um, packages for you to buy for health insurance. That's not real innovation. Just by saying, okay, we're only going to cover the amount over a certain point. That's not, that's not, you know, a breakthrough in healthcare. That's just spreading the cost around. What, why are deductibles going up? Like, were, did, was it a bad business model for the insurance agencies to like, were they losing money on, on, you know, what's called the float of the insurance company? So it's, um, I, you know, I think it's the, the two root causes I identify in the book, The Price We Pay, which is medical inflation that's been going up nonstop, a mass increase in the middlemen of healthcare with money games so sophisticated, they're designed so no one can understand them, but I expose them in very plain English so anybody can understand them, and then the pricing failures. So when you don't have to disclose a price, why not charge, you know, quadruple or 10 or 20 times. Our research started by with a study of emergency room bills showing that they range from one and a half times higher than what Medicare would pay to 23 times higher with everything in between. To deliver a baby in this city, New York City, it can cost you $6,000 for a standard uncomplicated labor and delivery or 70,000, actually technically $66,000. So six versus sixty-six thousand dollars. What's the difference in treatment? Like, why is there that spread? There's no difference in quality. Matter of fact, it's the same doctors just going to different hospitals. But it's sometimes it's it's the just the wild west. It's whatever people can get away with, and so there are these preset. You, why would you go to a six thousand dollar when uh, sixty-six thousand dollar hospital? You can go to six thousand if you don't if you're not paying the bill. Now I see because because. It's the same thing, almost like the student loan crisis. Like they can keep raising tuitions as long as they know the federal government is backing exactly. all the exactly. loans. Exactly. So employers have stepped in and here's the bright spot. And they said, hey, we want our employees to go to the $6,000 hospitals to deliver a baby. If you go there, we'll give you free diapers and wipes for a year because we want to, you can go anywhere and we'll pay for anywhere. And we're not telling you where you can and can't go. But 
here's an incentive. There's a company called Healthcare Blue Book that will write you a check for 100 or 200 bucks if you go to the lower cost MRI center if the quality is otherwise equal. Is there, is there, so th that's an example of like kind of uh, an entrepreneurship given this problem. So given that there's this large spread, they can afford $100 if an insurance company pays them $1,000 to avoid sending, you know, the, the patient to the $66,000 place and send them to the $6,000 place instead. Is there other innovations? Like, can someone start a deductible insurance company? Like, I'll take, you know, for a fee, I'll take all, care of all your deductibles. Yes, uh, there's certainly a whole bunch of those. And I, I'm really excited about the entrepreneurs. I met a lot of them for the book. But ultimately, what, what sort of, I guess, breaks my heart about this whole situation is that hospitals were built by churches, by and large, in the United States to be a safe haven for the sick and injured according to their charter, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or ability to pay, anybody would be welcome. So are, can people be turned away from ER if they clearly do not have the money and don't have insurance? Not for emergency care. There's a law that says hospitals are required to take care of any, anyone with an emergency. But if you have no insurance or you're out of a network and you have an elective situation, that is a non-urgent thing, good luck in America finding a hospital that will take you on for charity care. Charity care has become almost rare. What's, what's a, a situation of elective care that you don't think is that elective? Well, let's say you have um, colon cancer. If you don't have insurance or your deductible is prohibitively high for your income, um, that's something where we as a society should take care of those people. But now healthcare is so unaffordable, these people are getting shut out of the system. So, um, Right now, many hospitals are saying, oh, we do $100 million in charity care a year. Be careful of that number. Just gouging somebody with a high price and then taking whatever you can get is not charity, right? That delta is artificial. It's based on mm. how you marked it up. Mm. And if we can use honest terms like markups and price gouging and predatory billing, we can call out the practices out there. I personally believe, and I've told this to the White House and the members of Congress and you name it, Trump, Nancy Pelosi's office, the head of Medicare, that billing quality in medicine should be a part of hospital quality. When you look up a hospital's quality, you should look up their billing quality. What's their average markup? Can they, do they sue patients and garnish wages? Do they put liens on homes of low-income people? Hmm. And so, so again, and this is, this is what you talk about in both books, Unaccountable and the, and the Price We Pay, transparency is something that's lacking from the system. There's data and each hospital has data. Is, is the data easily available if I ask for it? Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 
when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. So the, no, it's not because right now there's the sticker prices, which are already out there. The sticker prices were required in January of this year to be publicly reported, but they're so egregious and variable and nobody, you know, is really getting at no, those prices aren't really fair and they're confusing. That's not meaningful. What we need in America is true price transparency. The real prices that the insurance companies and the hospitals negotiate, what the hospital will offer as a fair price to anybody. And then you'd have employers and what we call proxy shoppers in health economics do the shopping for the rest of people. When you Mm. go to the grocery store, you don't look at the price of a lemon, do you, when you buy a lemon or an orange? You rely on proxy shoppers. They keep the market in check. 10 or 15% of people, like my mom, you know, shop by the penny and compare, you know, a lemon or an orange at every single grocery store in town, and they're proxy shoppers. But, 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 uh, the, not really for grocery stores. There's nobody who, I mean, just the, like a lemon is a commodity. So people have a sense, oh, I can get lem- lemons anywhere and they get a sense of the price and they go to the cheapest place. Yeah. And you rely on the prices of, you know, the cereal and the milk to approximate the price of the lemons. And if they were to gouge people on lemons, you know, um, the word would get out, get out or the proxy shoppers would right. stop shopping there. Also, proxy shoppers are employers in the U.S., you're, most people get their insurance from their employer. Their employers are deciding who's in that network. Now, I met, I've met many business CEOs that are saying, I don't want this hospital in my network because they price gouge like crazy. I want this other hospital in my network. But they can't get at the prices. 
They're only getting hearsay from individual bills and crazy stories. Is there ever kind of a payola situation where some chain of hospitals that price gouges will pay to a company like, hey, put us, make us your hospital of choice and we'll pay you X amount of dollars? <laughs> yeah, the, the price gouging game and the network game is both the problem and the solution that they, they have created. It's all artificial. Creating a network is, the network is both the firefighter and the arsenic. A network of hospitals. Yes, it's the it's the boogeyman and it's the savior, right? If you come and go to a hospital, oh, you're out of the network, shame on you, like you did something wrong. The, the solution they offer is you've got to be in our network. Well, it's all artificial. If we just had honest, fair, transparent pricing, we wouldn't have these network games and people could shop, employers could shop, proxy shoppers could shop, and we'd have real competition. In so healthcare. again, it seems like figuring out a way to enforce transparency, like not only reveal prices, but there has to be some sense what the price should be. Yeah. So like, what should the price of a birth be? You know, should it be 6,000? Should it be 10? You know, should it be 66? Like, because because I don't know which one's too high and which one's too low. I want the best care too, because there's that factor. So people show me their egregious marked up bills and we look it up on Healthcare Blue Book, what the reference base price should be, just like Kelly Blue Book. How do they, how do they determine what it should be? So they get access to certain databases, including employers that hand over all their bills and they identify what the average price is in a certain area for a certain service. So Healthcare Blue Book is one innovation and it's one thing out there. I think it's a great company. They're one of the disruptors I highlighted in the price we pay. But I would love it. You know, you're friends with all these uh, hitters in the United States. I would love it if Google put on their website when you Googled a hospital, the average markup of that hospital. Is it versus, two? Versus the Healthcare Blue Book price. Yeah, you could use that. That's called the reference base price as the reference. Or you could use the Medicare price allowable amount, which is what we use in our research at Hopkins. What if Medicare is wrong? Well, we know Medicare is, well, first of all, we know Medicare is not perfect, but we know 70 plus percent of providers out there would gladly take Medicare patients or else they would turn down Medicare. So if they're accepting Medicare reimbursed Medicare patients and they like that money, then we know it's a roughly approximate to the true cost of doing the service or profitable for them. But, but when I go into a hospital, I don't necessarily have the Medicare prices all in a menu right in front of me. I'm going in there in an emergency. They could charge, uh, I'm knocked out. They could charge whatever. And I could, and if I say to them, hey, Medicare was only charging 10,000, you just charged me 25, they won't do anything? Um, look, one tip for any viewer listening is every hospital bill is negotiable. Even every service before you pay for it or agree to that service is negotiable. You just have to get to the right person. We've seen you know bills slash down 90%. And that tells you if they have that much room to come down, that there's a game going on. And a lot of these revenue cycle people are embarrassed by the game. And that's why they're very quick to offer these discounts. You just have to get to the right person. So so, so the main the main issues though are like are, are this price gouging, the out of network trick to sort of bill more, uh, the inflation of deductibles. Uh, it seems also there's and, and maybe this is in the next category the the treatment we get, but it seems also there's there's over prescription of services. So yeah. I get things that I didn't need or want. <laughs> yeah, too much medical care. Is, is this in the price part or is this in the over-prescription? Oh, inappropriate or care. Or inappro inappropriate yeah, care. Number two, root cause problems. So if number one root cause problem in healthcare is pricing failures, number two is inappropriate care, often too much care. By the way, just as a quick mention, there's nothing wrong with being out of network. If you're a doc and you, you there's supply and demand and you don't want to be in a network, or that's fine. But disclose that if you're at an in-network hospital. There it shouldn't be a bait and switch going on. You mean the on. doctor should disclose? Yeah, should disclose. Hey, look, I, you're going to get a separate bill from me because I don't participate in your insurance. And even though the hospital participates in your insurance, my care is separate from the hospital bill that insurance will pay. So here's a question. Why can't hospitals require every doctor working for them to accept the same insurance the hospital does? It's a great idea. Or why can't the hospitals cover the doctor's Somehow, like, can they have some sort of umbrella policy? If you're a doctor working in our hospital, our insurance will cover your costs. 
Look, James, that logic is so simple. It's brilliant and that's exactly what we need. And if you look at the bills in Congress right now, that's what they're proposing. And that's the kind of common sense thing that we need right now. I mean, people are getting hammered. But is it like hard for a doctor to get multiple insurance companies to accept his work? Yeah, but um, we can get our act together, right? If we're all working for a hospital, we can get our act together. We can have one master bill. We can have fair pricing. We, we don't have to price differently based on who you are. And these are the common sense reforms that we need and they're circulating around Congress right now because people are pissed. And who's against these bills? Oh, uh, you you would, um, if you saw the amount of money spent by the stakeholders of healthcare, the fourth largest um, contributor to campaigns is the hospital association. But why wouldn't the hospital be in favor of these laws? Because life is good. Life is good right now. But why? like, wouldn't it be better for them if they're charging even more because they're char- they're, they'll mark up the doctor that is, you know, working for them and. And, and they guarantee they get guaranteed payment because insurance pays for it. I'd love f- for you to talk to them and tell them that because we've been telling them the same thing. But look, if you're charging seventy thousand dollars for an uncomplicated delivery of a baby that is char- that for which the be- reference based price is six or seven, if you've got a tenfold markup on your service, do you really want to support price transparency legislation? As a human being, the hospital leaders tell me, yes, we need this, this is important. As a trade association, the lobbyists are fighting for the interests of their- Okay, so to be fair, if I was a hospital in that case, I wouldn't want transparency, right? I wanna make as much money as possible. And my argument would be, we do this so we could do charity, care, I'll have all sorts of arguments. But it seems like to a hospital, let's say I'm a hospital, it makes sense for me that all the doctors working at the hospital are in the same network as me. I don't want any out of network doctors because I don't want to have problems. I don't want to have patients calling my customer service all confused and going bankrupt and so on. I'd rather the doctor have the same insurance insurance company as me. And then I just mark up the doctor a little bit and I'm guaranteed the, their insurance company will pay me. That's one of the reforms I, I detail in the book, The Price We Pay. It's one of the reforms that's in uh, Congress right now, but it, peop- inaction is the worst enemy right now in healthcare. And we're seeing people just enjoy the status quo, the but, stakeholders. But like on that thing specifically, why would any uh, legislator be against that idea? Because the American Hospital Association is the fourth largest campaign contributor in the United States. But, but even then, like, again, you you and I both worked out the, the math. It's better for the hospitals. Well, people aren't shopping though. Uh, you mean for them to accept these out of network Doctors as or, in network. Or force the, the doctors to be in network. Forcing doctors to do anything is never easy, right? But then I won't hire them if they're not in network. Well, a lot of times the doctors have the leverage. I mean, you've got ER groups, GI groups, cardiology groups that staff every hospital in an entire region. Okay. And so who's calling the shot? Who's working for whom? And if there's one business model in healthcare that's been the defining business model of the last five years, it's that if you can pull something out of the hospital bill, if you can pull the lab cost or the x-ray or the air ambulance bill or the ambulance bill or the doctor's fee out of that master bill and bill separately out of network, you can collect a lot more. And we've seen this massive fragmentation. When you buy a car, you don't pay separately for the steering wheel and the spark plug and the belts and the axle and, but that's exactly what you have in healthcare. And people are getting hammered with these surprise bills. And, and do the hospitals make more because it's so separated out? Well, every, every piece, every stakeholder is making more because it's a, it's a money grab. Every group is taking more money out of the system. I see. And so you have people going in for a simple set of you know, stitches and they're getting hit with four or five surprise bills that are out of network. This is- Because the- this anesthesiology group is called in, this doctor's called in. The, uh, this x-ray technician is called in and then the hospital charges. Yeah, you deliver a baby the, and it's the, the obstetrician is out of your network that night that they're on call. The anesthesiologist that put the epidural in is out of network. The, and the pediatrician who sees the baby is out of network. And if the hospital says to the doctor, well, you have to be in network, the doctor could just say no, but what are you gonna do on Thursday night when you have no other obstetricians on call? Well, that's one problem, but also we need to get our act together and, at hospitals and just do this because it's the right thing for patients. I mean, where's the spirit of altruism? Where's that 
those bright medical students. Well, to your point, though, all these private equity firms are buying these hospital groups and doctors groups. So they're just they're just about the bottom line. Well, That's just their mentality. Well, why I'm not else? excusing them. Exactly. What what I, I agree with you. Why else would they be buying specifically doctors where you have almost no choice? They're buying emergency room, radiologists. Do you pick which radiologist reads your x-ray? Anesthesiologists, neonatologists. I mean, who picks their neonatologists? <laughs> well, this like take radiology. Will this get better as uh, AI starts reading yes. X-ray. So, yes. so there's some there's some areas where technology is going to just sort of move move the needle, and that will solve part of the problem. So, so, so I want to ask about the inappropriate care because it's all related, right? It's because <laughs> yeah. people get charged for inappropriate care too. Yeah, that's the ultimate sort of double whammy, right? You yeah. have inappropriate care, then you're price gouged for it. Yeah. So you have a great example with with the Shah in in uh, 1979. The doctor operated on him, was convinced he was brilliant, did a great job, the shot was fine, and then a week later he's practically dead because the doctor cut his pancreas and his doctor was in complete denial. Yeah, the United States sent over Michael DeBakey, who's a, an amazing and famous heart surgeon, to operate on the Shaw, but the Shaw did not have a heart problem. The Shaw had a spleen problem, and the, DeBakey was not a surgeon for the spleen. Now, he's got good hands, but, I mean... He had a complication. There was a pancreatic fistula from injuring the tail of the pancreas when he removed the spleen. And that fluid built up, got infected. And, you know, it's a great example of how people are flying blind. They think some guy's the best or some woman's the best at this, you know, procedure or expertise. The reality is we're, we're not great at humility in medicine. We're not great at, I don't know. We're not great at, see my partner because they have more experience. Is that because of the legal ramifications also? No, I think it's the individualism that we promote in medical school. It's competitive. There's a bias towards uh, competitiveness, individualism, and performance. And so it's a referral business. Like I'm a surgeon at Johns Hopkins, even though I work at a hospital, it's a referral business. Medicine in New York is the classic referral business. Only in New York do I hear vascular surgeons telling me, you know, Marty, I did this procedure, the patient didn't need it done, but I know for a fact, 100%, if I didn't do it, they were gonna go across the street to the other surgeon and they would do it unnecessarily. So I'd rather be the one doing it. Who, who's telling them to do it? The patients, well, they just see the opportunity to do it and they see that the patient will get a second opinion because it's very common in New York City. And they figure if someone's going to get it done, I might as well. Be. Now, this is not most surgeons. Most doctors do the right thing and always try to. But we see this sort of, we ask doctors in the United States, how common is the problem of unnecessary surgery? National study published from Johns Hopkins, 11% of surgery is unnecessary. That's and, what the and, doctors say. And how much of that is mistaken unnecessary and how much of that is, let's call it malicious unnecessary? I think it's like we get that we as surgeons notoriously under recognize the risks and we overstate the benefits mentally. That's how we think. We think things are very safe. We tend to minimize the complications. We oversell things. I mean, that's how we think of it in our minds. So it's not that we're being malicious sometimes. So we've got these biases. But, but once again. Oh, oh and, and can I ask, is the bias fueled a little bit by like will will malpractice err on no prescription or yeah. or uh, oh I did this surgery yes there was a you know a within range predictable accident and and it's a, like you know are they more confident they won't be accused of malpractice if they do the surgery than if they don't and the patient needed it so mal the malpractice fear goes both ways it people avoid doctors avoid doing things because of malpractice fears just as much as they probably do too much. Now, um, malpractice is a tricky one. All the experts have suggested it's less than 1% of medical costs. It's not the real driver. And where it is, doctors sometimes just need to take a stand. Now, certain areas of medicine are getting hammered, obstetrics, neurosurgery in rural communities. There we need real malpractice reform. But check out the movie um, Bleed Out, and you'll see the story of how malpractice laws are not as... Um, liberal, as people think. In other words, they tend to favor physicians. They put caps. They have committees review cases before they can go to court, and depending on the state. And the idea of the frivolous lawsuit 
is really extremely rare. Uh, you know, the largest lawsuit in U.S. history for a malpractice case from our research was $75 million. So the idea that there's like a billion dollar lawsuit for doing an unnecessary MRI where somebody cleans out their psychic powers from the magnet. I mean, those are, you know, those are t long, t tall tales that it, are not the problem. That, that's interesting because I sort of like anytime someone dies, I always hear their some relative will say, there's malpractice, we're going to sue. But you're saying it just doesn't happen that much in reality. No, I'm, say, I'm saying that, that medical care goes wrong a lot. But I'm saying the fear of malpractice making doctors do the wrong thing is, uh, or too much care is probably overstated in our minds. Now, there's individual cases, of course, people are going to disagree. But the idea that um, so let me just tell you, we asked doctors this question. When they answered that 11% of surgery is unnecessary and 21% of overall all medical care is unnecessary. This is the voice of doctors nationwide in the U.S. study. We asked them why. And they said, number one, sort of um, a consumerist culture, people coming in demanding stuff, right? Moms coming in demanding an antibiotic for their kids with the viral sniffles. So, so yeah, what's an example of something where patients really think they need care, but they just don't, and it happens all the time? I'd say the pill culture. Look, 10 years ago, we doctors in the United States prescribed 2.4 billion prescriptions. Last year, it hit 5 billion. Did disease double in the last five years? No, we have a crisis of appropriateness. So, so yeah, when, so, okay, this is... <laughs> I'm get, by the way, I'm getting free medical advice from you right now without having to pay for it. So like if someone gets a scratch and it becomes infected, do you need antibiotics always to cure it? So my, I was grown, I grew up thinking it's my, my grandma's wisdom is that if you get an infection, you, only, you, you can only cure it with an antibiotic. So, you know, as a surgeon, I can tell you open wounds don't get infected when they're exposed to the open generally speaking. Now, there's exceptions where there's not good blood supply and you do need to give antibiotics or topical antibiotics. But the overuse of antibiotics in medicine is one of the most egregious areas of overuse. And it's creating resistant superbugs that, that are going to come back with a vengeance. So when should I not use antibiotics if someone says use antibiotics? <laughs> General principle, and, and I, you know, should kind of clarify, this does not constitute the practice of medicine and no doctor-patient relationship is formed. If something is red, antibiotics are uh, probably appropriate. If something is burning, if something is warm, if um, something is worsening. Um, so then, like a rash though, it seems like an, that, that is in pain a little bit, that's probably needs an antibiotic. Um, well, a lot of things can cause rashes that are not, bacterial infections that respond to antibiotics. But generally, if things are red, burning, increasing, uh, warm, giving you a fever, those are antibiotic-related. Those are bacteria-related And if you don't take the antibiotic, will it just get worse and worse? Or will it ultimately get better? If it's a bacterial infection, it can get worse. So we take things very seriously, like uh, dental abscesses or infections after surgery. We take those very seriously in closed cavities. Open wounds, like I said, are usually open and they don't get infected. But what, what about something like, uh, and this is almost off topic, but what about something like Lyme disease? Like my kid had Lyme disease and I avoided for a year having her on antibiotics, but then finally the school made her go on antibiotics. <laughs> well, well, generally speaking, Lyme disease, you want to treat with antibiotics. It's a spirochete and it does respond to antibiotics, especially if you treat it early in the course of Lyme disease. The tricky thing with Lyme disease is um, diagnosing it. And so, you know, there's a, there's a series of tests out there and some people think they have Lyme disease and they don't and vice versa. And it's tricky. Okay, so so back to inappropriate care. What are other kind of big red flags that you discovered on your quest around hospitals in America? Just just um, to note, that's how you researched this book is you went all over the country. This is not just research based. That you went all over the country and had firsthand experience seeing seeing these situations. Yeah, I really enjoyed doing the research for the book, The Price We Pay, traveling around America for two years, visited twenty two cities talked to women that had C-sections and their doctors, insurance executives, everyone in health, every level of healthcare. And I would say 
C-sections was a big one. We found hospitals where one doctor had a C-section rate of 100% and the other doctors had C-section rates in the teens. And they all randomly took call nights. So it's not like they had their sicker patients are all on call on random nights where people just come in randomly. So was it just that this guy was very confident that if he did a C-section, it would result in a healthy baby and he wasn't confident otherwise? I think it was sloppy medicine. Look, C-sections are generally more profitable and they're easier and they provide, I wouldn't say easier, but they provide more certainty for your evening. They're better for planning, right? Do you want to wait all night being, you know, waking up all night waiting for a woman in labor to get to that point where you're going to do a vaginal delivery? Or do you want to tell them at eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, hey, maybe we should do a C-section. It might be safer for the baby. Hmm. The second a doctor says that, guess what? A hundred percent of women in labor anywhere in the world are going to say, do the C-section. It reminds me of the um, when a woman's pregnant, what's that thing where they get the, uh, the amniocentesis? So every doctor says, oh, you know, you have to get amnio. I don't want to say every doctor, but every doctor I've encountered says you have to get the amniocentesis. And then, or no, and then if you say no, so this is what's happened to me with not me personally, but my, the, the mother of my children. Uh, if you say no, they always find some test where, oh, there's double the, the possibility of this extremely rare disease. They don't mention that it was, it was went from one in a million to two in a million. It's, I, you know, people cry like I have a hundred percent more chance of getting <laughs> this, this disease. And I don't, they don't know any other statistics about it, but they go rush right into the amniocentesis. Yeah, exactly. We see a lot of that. We, you know, we see tests done where we ask, what are you going to do differently based on a test result? We ask this of the doctor who's sending us the patient. I'm a specialist myself. I'm a cancer surgeon. You know, you got this test. Why did you get it done? Tell me how the result will change the treatment course. And if it's not, if it's just out of, out of your curiosity, that's the unnecessary, that's the waste in healthcare. That's the inappropriate care. So, 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 you know, how much, so, so more inappropriate care, like what's, so, um, how, how can I protect myself? And this, this is really going between both books now. So unaccountable and the price we pay. What, what are hospitals not telling me that I should know to protect myself both on pricing and appropriate care? And then what's the role of nutrition and wellness in all of this? Yeah. Uh, I just asked you pretty massive questions. Just how do we fix <laughs> right the healthcare third, right system? Third book. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we put a bunch of resources up on uh, the website, restoringmedicine.org on how to fight your medical bill, on um, in, guidance for employers and CEOs who want to save money because most businesses are getting ripped off on their healthcare benefits and their pharmacy benefit manager plans. Um, in terms of too much medical care, which is an epidemic, we also have the problem of too little care and the rural access problem, but by far the problem of too much medical care dominates our cost crisis. Anytime you need something major done, a major elective operation, you're gonna start a new medication for the rest of your life, for example, get a second opinion, get a third opinion if it makes you feel better, ask questions, Google the heck out of it, find out, educate yourself. And there's a lot of great resources out there that people don't realize. Um, why are we treating hypertension with medication when we could be treating it with yoga? Why are we, now certain cases it's too high and it's out of the range for that you know, you're not gonna lower our blood pressure in, in half with yoga. But when people come in with these borderline conditions and we give them a medication, it's because we're on a treadmill that docks are, have 10 minutes with the patient and it's this reflex and they're burnt out and they don't like it and the consumer's culture. So recognize that 21% of medical care is unnecessary according to the voice of doctors in a national survey. How about diabetes cooking classes as a way to treat high blood sugars? How about well, meditation for hypertension? And for, for diabetes, is there, or diabetes too, is there evidence that instead of prescribing all these insulin shots, what if they just eliminated sugar or as much sugar as possible from their diet? Does that help? Or is there is there holistic non-medicine alternatives in some cases? And I'm not talking about weird holistic stuff, but just like basic nutritional 
things that they can do to solve serious problems. The field of nutrition has been corrupted in healthcare for most of its history, most of its academic modern history. We've been given the food pyramid and we've had the food industry tell us things like, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Oh, really? Where'd that come from? That came from a General Mills marketing campaign, well, right? Pancakes and bacon, though, are really the God's food. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you, you look pretty healthy, so I'd say whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I'm not doing pancakes, <laughs> but I do do bacon. <laughs> well, if you look at it, the question, is fat bad for you? Medicine's never really had an answer for that. It turns out all the research shows that there's no association between saturated fat and heart disease. There is research and there's evidence of the best types of oils to cook with, but doctors don't know it. We don't teach it. This is not, it hasn't made the mainstream science literature because the journals don't want to hear from non-randomized trials. So, Coconut oil is what you should uh, cook with. Oh, really? Coconut oil. So, so let me ask you this. So you, you, you know, you're 14 years in school or residency or whatever, and you're learning the Krebs cycle whatever you referred to before, how come they don't have one course on nutrition and wellness? And, and, and you mentioned a couple of things too. There's lots of like basic procedures that solve problems. Yeah. That, that instead of the complicated procedures. Well, the, the medical establishment, if you will, has created a curriculum and a testing sy system that tests on certain things. So it doesn't matter how creative you are as a dean of a medical school, you got to get your kids through that testing system. And as long as they're testing on these things, that's what the curriculums focus on. And if you go in there and talk to people about bedside manner or communication uh, skills or how to break bad news, they're smart enough to know, okay, I just park that for a little bit. I got to get through this exam, right? These are smart kids. They, they know what they've got to do. They know what they've been told to do. And so just going in there and teaching kids that are under the gun to regurgitate all this information is a failed model. We've got, to, we've got to change fundamentally the core competencies that we teach in medical school. It, it also seems like, depending on your specialty, should adjust your education, even the time spent. So I, I just did a podcast recently with the producer of the movie, um, Ask for Jane. And it was about uh, a group of women in 1970 who helped other women get abortions, which were then illegal. Now they ran out of doctors. So these women taught themselves how to do an abortion. They did something like 11,000 abortions without one fatality. And uh, they taught themselves to be essentially doctors for abortion. Like I'm, I'm curious how many specialized skills could be taught in a matter of weeks instead of 14 years. Look, if we just let nurses and technicians practice at the top of their license, you know, for the stuff they're trained to do and the, and the stuff they can do, we could harness this mass energy and talent and compassion to do a lot more in healthcare. At Johns Hopkins, our head of the GI department is having nurse practitioners and physician assistants do screening colonoscopy procedures. Why not? You know, I can take a kid from high school and probably show them how to do half of the basic skills of wound care and surgery if I had enough time with them and if they were motivated and determined and had that empathy. Right, and you refer to that like almost moving back to an, a more of an apprenticeship type system. Yeah. So is that possible? Because it seems like that would be great. It is, and I love the curriculum. I, you know, I always try to have bright spots in the book, the price we pay, and Jefferson Medical School has the most innovative curriculum. This guy, Steve Clasco, is doing incredible work. He's basically accepting students based on empathy and self-awareness. And then he says, if you meet a certain benchmark grade point average, say a three, four or higher. I'm just gonna hire based on empathy and self-awareness and communication skills. He accepts those kids and he really just beautifully walks them down the art of medicine and how to do great bedside care and think about holistic care and everything out there. And you, you mentioned in Unaccountable, uh, kind of the statistics that essentially what determined what the statistic that most determines success in a surgery is how many times a doctor has conducted that surgery. And it resonated with me because I'm, I've always been writing about, you know, the needs for different types of 
educational systems, whether it's college or law school or whatever, like how long does it take to really learn a skill? Um, and I remember I was at a dinner once, somebody asked me uh, and asked me kind of in this rude way, well, what would you prefer? Uh, a, a doctor operating you on you who didn't go to school or a, a doctor, a brain surgeon who graduated from Harvard Medical School? And I, 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 said, the an, I said the answer, which is I'd rather have a doctor who's done a thousand brain surgeries. <laughs> I don't care where they went to school. I just want like real, really experienced doctor. And I was glad you made that point. Finally, 10 years later, I see someone who makes that point in, in, the book, in your book. But that does seem to be the way to go. Like that would have solved the Shah's problem, for instance, it's <laughs> the heart doctor operating on the spleen. Yeah. And the book, Unaccountable, I basically try to help people decipher and navigate the healthcare system to get care for themselves, letting them know what goes on behind the scenes, how doctors find care for themselves, how we do it for ourselves. And what, what, what do you do? So basically you delineate, are we looking for a diagnostician that is someone who can figure out what's wrong with me? Or are, am I looking for a proceduralist somebody who's just technically the best at what they do. So once you figure out that you definitely need something done, you wanna to go to the person who has a lot of um, skill with that procedure, a lot of experience, what we call volume in, our, in the health economics literature, and also somebody who's responsive. The ER doctors will tell you which surgeons don't answer their call when somebody has a complication, or the ER nurses will tell you, which doctors don't show up when one of their patients is in problem has a problem. So you want somebody who's got a lot of uh, volume and somebody who's responsive. For the diagnostic uh, um, doctor, the doctor who's trying to figure things out, you want to look for humility and listening skills. What What is a diagnostic doctor? Like I've never heard someone say I'm a diagnostician. Yeah, it's <laughs> They're a, usually like a liver doctor or a heart doctor. I mean, no one ever says I'm a diagnostic doctor. It's a category of doctors. So every, every doctor is in part one or the other. So, you know, I'm probably 80% procedural, 20% diagnostic. So if I went to you, would I say, would I ask, should the patient ask what, that was just your subjective view of what you are. How does the patient know if you're a diagnostician and a, or, or a proceduralist? Yeah, so I try to give um, pathways on based on the condition. For example, the Lyme disease example that you gave. You want to find somebody who's seen a lot of Lyme disease and maybe a primary care doctor who's referred a lot of patients with Lyme disease and has had that loop closed back to know what the outcome was. And they can help decide, did you get the right tests or not? Or maybe there's more tests to do. I, I found in that one specific case, uh, or, or actually yeah, in a real, another family member with Lyme disease, uh, Lyme doctors think everything is Lyme. <laughs> you know, it, it, it reminds me of uh, another situation. If We all kind of know that the dinosaurs died because an asteroid hit the earth. But if you ask a volcanologist, someone who's a specialist in volcanoes, they're all convinced, no, nah, that's not true. There was some big volcano that wiped out the dinosaurs. So every doctor is going to, you know, it's their nail and they, or they, I don't know what the expression is. They've that's this is their hammer, so they're going to use it. Yeah, well, you're going to you're always going to have different levels of of uh, how shall I say, like doctors who re, who really have a command of their field. So, for example, cholesterol testing. If you go into a doctor's office in the United States, ninety plus percent of doctors for that annual checkup are going to say, "Oh, we need to get a cholesterol panel, total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL." Well, guess what? That's like. 40 years old, and it's mostly not helpful. The LDL is a reasonable proxy of your cholesterol profile. But how about lipoprotein little a, which is a blood test every person in the United States should get at some point in their life. Turns out you only need it really tested for once. The New York Times had an article titled, and I thought it was a great title, the blood test that one in five Americans test positive for that predicts early heart disease but few doctors have ever heard of. What about what about cancer type stuff? So you go in, you have some pains, they want to throw you right in some kind of, I don't know, X-ray tube <laughs> some for cat, like hours. A CAT scan or yeah. an MRI? Yeah. Um, I like your colloquial uh, description of our medical procedures. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, there's judgment to it, right? And this is where we, we're not taught in medical school how to manage that gray zone. What's the trigger point for doing something? What's the threshold for intervening or testing? 
you know, I talked to a neurosurgeon who basically told me, he's a really good neurosurgeon, great technical skills. I said, I have a friend who had a headache. How do you evaluate what headaches to get an MRI on? He says, I, I, I would just get an MRI. I said, no, I mean, I'm asking like, just so I learn what th how bad is the headache where you say we should go. He says, I just, look, I just get an MRI on everybody. And I realized, you know, he has incredible technical skills, but doesn't have that sense of what's the appropriate threshold. So, you know, these are all things to weigh and consider. Now, when you talk about cancer, you don't want to mess around. You, you know, you want to be aggressive with, with um, evaluating cancer. But there's like 6,000 cancers. You can't test for them all. Well, we shouldn't be doing blanket screenings for cancer because you end up with unnecessary care. And yet many cancers are asymptomatic until it's too late. Well, certainly that's the case with the cancer I deal with, which is pancreas cancer. 80% is the mortality rate and few people really get through it. Um, so we do want to, you know, when somebody has symptoms, we want to get to it quickly. We don't want to overscreen everybody. We don't want to do routine CAT scans because CAT scans have radiation. And if you find something that's a normal variation and end up in the operating room, you're probably more likely to die of the complication than you are from that normal variation. So the, we have cancer guidelines. There's no blanket rules, but we have cancer guidelines that are specific to the condition. So for example, um, with prostate testing, there's guidelines. With mammograms, you know, I personally believe if you don't have risk factors, you start at age 50 instead of 40. That's where I think the data fall. Doctors will tell me, you know, some, the doctors will disagree. Some think you should get mammograms in high school, which is crazy because there's normal fibrocystic disease that gives false positives. So there's guidelines that are specific. And this is where you want a really good doc. But if you want to know whether or not a doctor is good, ask them if they have heard of Peter Atia, who's got a great podcast on health. Oh, and you you mentioned him in the the price we pay. Yeah, and uh, he had kind of mal. He was a doctor, but still had a bad, a very bad uh, treatment that that caused disability. Yeah, he's he's um, I think fully recovered, but he had wrong site surgery. They operated on the wrong site, and he basically I think at some point got disillusioned with the facade of healthcare. Right with this the establishment telling everybody, this is what we have to do on everyone. If your blood pressure is over this amount, we slap them with an antihypertensive medication. If your cholesterol is above this amount, we slap them with a cholesterol lowering drug. And he's like, hey, wait wait a minute. What about what about food? What about lifestyle? What about the, the real data to support? Yeah, like I have a friend who's had high cholesterol and he's on some anti-cholesterol stuff for the rest of his life. Does he need it? So we, you know, what the guidelines don't factor is your ethnicity, right? My family is Egyptian. Maybe folks from the Near East are more designed for the starvation state and the high cholesterol can be okay and more, you know, bigger range of normal variation. And no one in my family has ever had heart disease. People live into their 90s with high cholesterol, untreated. So we need to factor ethnicity. We need to factor personal goals, and the, the data often are not doing this. The medical establishment has sort of given us the Framingham study, which is Anglo, you know, Euro-Americans who have lived in New England. And we, that, those results have been extrapolated, by the way, to men and women, even though, you know, some of that data, original data was done in men. Peter Atia looks at the real, he's, he's sort of a serial obsessionist of science. And he'll look at, why do we say hormone replacement therapy causes cancer when the data show it doesn't cause cancer? Let's go back and let's re-educate. And to this day, talk to you know half of primary care doctors or any doctor in the United States. If a woman comes in really struggling with symptoms of menopause, the doc could say, uh, when you ask, what about hormone replacement therapy? More than half of doctors will say, well, it causes cancer. It doesn't cause cancer, right? It, it, the, the, the data are clear. It's in the article. The whole story of how it was broadcast as causing cancer was a story of individuals, largely men, advancing their academic careers in this sort of, you know, in cahoots with the journals and the media. And so it was a giant misservice. And of course, because it's women, 
you know, men in the medical establishment relegate this to as, oh, just tough it out. You know, this is not a real issue. Well, guess what? Everyone deals with menopause differently. Some women really struggle. It causes serious symptoms, physical symptoms, pain, sometimes depression, all kinds of uh, problems. Some women, you know, go through it with a breeze. But for those that really struggle, these are medical symptoms. These are real feelings. These are real signs and medical conditions. Why can't we give them the treatment that they deserve that the data show is appropriate for them? And it's because the medical establishment has decided that this you know, horrible study called the Women's Health Initiative is the gold standard, even though it's, um, the data doesn't even support what the authors proposed. Gosh, I, so, I, have, I, have, I have so many more questions. And you're t- but no one's knocking on the door here. You're telling me to wrap, but no one's knocking on the door. Can we just keep going until they knock? Uh, we can go for five more minutes. That would be great. Just five more bigger. Because when they knock, they probably just have to like set up and then have to break down too. All right. So are you okay? Yeah. So, so, okay, here's another question I have. I'm just going to keep asking questions then. Someone gets basic cancer. I know that doesn't mean anything. There's all sorts of cancers and it's stage one and the doctor automatically says chemotherapy. How often is chemotherapy overprescribed? Like, would you do chemotherapy uh, for most cancers you might be prescribed with? Uh, if it's highly curable, yes. Ch- chemotherapy is overprescribed. All you have to do is talk to oncologists, get a couple beers in them at the American Society of Clinical Oncology Conference. They'll tell you. And uh, there's, it's a cash cow chemotherapy. Uh, for the most part, it depends on the agent, of course. Is it overprescribed when there's no hope or is it overprescribed when you don't need it? Both, mm-hmm. both. Look, I see patients with pancreatic cancer getting hammered with radiation and chemo after surgery. And I'm kind of like, uh, there's never been a study showing that radiation improves survival after surgery. Why are we doing it? So, so okay, so that's when they're too late almost or or beyond. Uh, what about when I, when someone first gets cancer? Is it is How often is it overprescribed then? Like, why can't I just go to the cancer drugs as opposed to doing chemotherapy first? Um, <clears throat> the, well, cancer drugs generally are considered in the domain of chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, I think the treatment algorithms, people trust their doctors. Look, when pe- patients come in to see me, they have one emotion that's guiding all their decisions. They're scared shitless, right? They're, they're petrified. They often latch on, doc, tell me what I should do and I'll do it. We do get the highly informed patient that comes in with Google printouts of all these, you know, what do you think about this experimental treatment? Do you get annoyed with them? No, I encourage it. I okay. encourage it. Um, Some doctors get annoyed. They I call get, it Dr. Google. I get annoyed if the spouse of the patient will call me and ask me all the questions that I already answered. And I realize the spouse is not really asking, it's the patient pushing the spouse to call and ask the same questions. But no, I mean, look, people are scared, they're acting irrational and, and you know they're, they're allowed to be crazy when you get a diagnosis like that. With breast cancer, stage one breast cancer, if you have a certain type of breast cancer, we know now that, if, that you should get a gene test and the gene test will tell you whether or not chemo can even will even work. If the gene test comes out a certain way, the chemo won't even work and you shouldn't be getting it. So why aren't we getting that gene test in every patient that's a candidate for that gene test telling us whether or not the chemo will work? Well, if life is good giving everybody chemo and filling the chemo chairs, then you know why do this new thing? People get set in their ways when, you know, life is good as is for the business. See, I feel like all of these things you're telling me, like, for instance, the hormone repo- replacement therapy doesn't cause, uh, uh, har- hormone replacement therapy doesn't cause cancer. The high cholesterol doesn't cause, or fat doesn't cause heart disease. Um, it's almost like there's another book needed. Like, it's just a simple, yeah, you know, <laughs> almost like here's 101 things, you know, the medical industry got wrong and you need to know for your health. Yeah, so I tried to pack as many of those take-home tips in the last half of The Price We Pay, where I get into inappropriate care. So people can be educated and go to their doctor and say, I learned about LP little a, lipoprotein little a. I'd like to get it 
checked? And can you also send an apoprotein B and a C-reactive protein? Those are the three tests that I think every American should be getting to figure out if you're at risk of heart disease. I've met doctors in doing the research for the price we pay who have done the right tests and followed patients and for 30 plus years have never had a single patient have a heart attack in their practice or um, any major cardiac event. Why? Because they're testing the right stuff and they're recommending the right stuff. A new association called the Association for Lifestyle Medicine is now saying, hey, instead of just medicating the hell out of everybody, can we talk about things you can do differently in your day-to-day routine? Like It reminds me of like in psychiatry, somebody will go into a psychiatrist depressed and they get prescribed an antidepressant. Yep. But maybe their parent just died <laughs> and they're, of course, situationally depressed. An antidepressant probably won't do anything, you know, because they're not clinically depressed. I mean, I don't know how much of a difference there is, but it seems like there's some difference. It seems like the same thing. Like people are just throwing these medications around. Yeah, and I see patients come in and they sort of whisper to me almost routinely when I see somebody. We go over their medication list and they say, oh yeah, and I'm on so and such and such medication for depression. I have depression. And I tell them, it's okay. Everyone in the United States has depression. Okay, we all get depressed and there's an epidemic going on right now. It's called loneliness. In my opinion, one of the biggest public health crises in America. I talk about it in the book, The Price We Pay. How about treating that loneliness with community, right? How about these seniors that come in? The number one thing we see in seniors is this sense of isolation and loneliness. And guess what? It affects every physiological system in their body. Sure. I mean, have you ever read uh, The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner? Yes. So, and he basically talks about this area in Aventura, California, where they're, they're, every other blue zone, so there's all these blue zones, people live to a high quality of life after the age of 100, so he studied them. They were all demographically the same, except Aventura, California has people from every demographic. And the common factor is Sunday, because they're all it's made mostly Seventh Day Adventists there. Sunday they all spend the day together hiking. So yeah. They have community and they all live to a hundred. And the community is powerful, right? You see it when there's a couple and one of the spouses dies and the other spouse dies soon after, right? That's affecting their physiological reserves. And I think modern medicine is great with certain things replacing your heart valve, right? You want to be in the United States for that. When you come in with general inflammation and malaise and low energy, we don't know what to do with it sometimes. And, and what we're going to be talking about in five and 10 years, I believe firmly from all my research in the, for the book, The Price We Pay, and everything I've been talking to uh, with people I respect in the field, like Peter Atia and Tony Kalu and these folks, we're going to be talking about your inflammatory state as a, as a marker of your health and your human biome, right? We've got this equilibrium of bacteria that live in your GI system. We throw it out of whack with all kinds of stuff like antibiotics and bad food. And then we realize, hey, people are sick. We have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease that didn't exist before antibiotics. We've created some diseases. We've created all this poor health from things like bad food we're going to be talking about your biome health in 10 years, I think, as a medical profession and your inflammatory health. It's funny because I think, I feel like non doctors who are interested in the medical industry do talk about this stuff. So there's various podcasts and people who've done self experimentation who focus on inflammation and, and then they've developed their anti carb diets. And, um, uh, you know, Naveen Jain is a billionaire. Uh, he's been on the podcast. He's, he has a company focused on the human biome. I don't know what he does with it, but I've just heard him talk about it. Yeah, and gene, t- gene typing, yeah. Yeah, so I feel like non-doctors are talking about it, and, and but I guess it hasn't infiltrated into medical school, so doctors don't talk about it as much. Yeah, non-doctors talk about it, some of which are spot on and some of which are quacks and way mm-hmm. out there. And I think medicine didn't know what to do, do with that diversity of heterogeneous ideas. And they kind of just globally rejected with the mantra that there's no randomized controlled trial. Well, guess what? There doesn't have to be. We can learn from before and after studies. We can learn from observation. We can learn from clinical wisdom. Medical establishment does not like it when we talk like that as researchers. I've been trying to get Hopkins researchers 
to talk more like that because that's how we think. So, so uh, first off, I want to again say everybody should should get this book, The Price We Pay, uh, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. Um, actually, Steve Forbes, who's been on the podcast, is your blurb on the top, a must read for every American and business leader. I like how he, he adds, and business leader. You know, logically, all the business leaders in America are Americans. They're also. Americans as well. <laughs> so he makes a logical fallacy, but that's fine. We'll forgive Steve Forbes. <laughs> uh, but it's so important. This is the most important thing in our lives is our health and then our financial health, which we're losing as we try to protect our health. Uh, I guess I still have questions. Okay, I'm 51, never been to a doctor. What should I do? <laughs> so it's um, it would be good to get the the cholesterol panel that I mentioned, LP little a, apoprotein B, and C-reactive protein, and an assessment of your ethnicity and family history of heart disease. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing is to go over sleep and food. Chronic bad sleep causes Alzheimer's, I'm convinced. Just talk to the head of the Berkeley Sleep Center. And so learning about all the things that maximize the quality of sleep and avoiding things that disrupt sleep is important for your health because I, rest I sleep is great. Health. Well, that's good. Keep going. Uh, you're one of few Americans that sleep great then. And um, the other thing is food. You want your body to be in a low inflammatory state. That means avoiding simple sugars <clears throat> over um, complex sugars are slower to, to absorb, so they're not as bad as the refined sugars. But generally speaking, you want a low carbohydrate load in your system. If you want to go mega healthy and try keto, I think it takes a lot of discipline. But certainly any of those diets, be it South Beach, keto, low carb, you name it, anything is going to be better than the standard American diet or what we call SAD, the SAD diet. <laughs> so any of those, um, that those are all pro-health things. Avoid um, the processed foods, avoid things that are pre-made and you you know you, you sort of pull out of a can or and 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 cook generally speaking things that you can cook are going to be healthier healthier than things that you can just buy and eat um, be careful about pesticides roundup there's a report showing that it probably causes cancer that's what the report said they got to be careful of course with lawyers i can just tell you right off the bat i, I avoid it altogether Roundup is a weed killer, and it's on almost all these non-organic things that we eat, produce, fruit, vegetable, you name it. So a strawberry has been sprayed on average 15 times. So how do you avoid the pesticides? So you want to buy organic produce, when, uh, especially when there's the peel that you're, you're going to be consuming the peel. Hmm. When um, buying fish, you want to avoid fish that are farmed in closed environments because the heavy metals build up in the fish. Fish can be very healthy. Omega-3 fats are good. They balance out the omega-3, omega-6 imbalance that we have in our modern diet. But you want if to If I avoid. eat in a sushi restaurant, how do I know? You have to ask, and I think more people are asking. And mm. when all of us ask, they're responding to the demand. Uh, you want to you know, buy local foods. The farm-to-table movement is a great movement in America. Um, Cooking with, um, you know, uh, things like coconut oil, eating nuts, um, of, um, avoiding things that are processed and high in their sugar and carbohydrate load. What nuts are good? Um, I, I don't know of any specific um, nuts that, that are more healthy than others, but I will tell you that some believe macadamia nuts have something in it that's um, healthier. Um, I, I can only handle so many macadamia nuts or I want to vomit sometimes, but I like, you know, five or 10 and then I got to stop. Um, so um, you, you mentioned breakfast earlier. Do you kind of avoid breakfast or what do you, yeah. what's your breakfast? Yeah, I don't, I don't subscribe to the modern day phenomena of produced by the food industry that everyone has to eat a large breakfast in the morning. I don't think we were made like that. I think, I don't think our biome was designed for it. I think that you know, hunters and gatherers would get these large sums of food and then sort of eat large meals. And I think that's why you're seeing the f micro and mini fasting 
um, movement grow in the United States. There was a small uh, animal experiment that showed if you sort of segmentally fast the animals that they could have a better longevity. So it created a lot of interest. Of course, it wasn't, it was kind of a sloppy study, but maybe there's something to fasting. If you think about how we were designed, how we sort of, um, you know, changed over time, did we really have, you know, food in four and five hour increments, uh, you know, all of our waking hours? Uh, no. So the, you know, when, when the food industry puts these things out like milk, right? We have to drink milk. Why are we drinking milk? Were we really meant to drink so much cow's milk? Is that how, all right, this is messing up the human biome. And so I like um, either macadamia uh, milk, I like almond milk or a mix of different types of milk. I don't love coconut milk that, that much, although anything with coconut is generally very healthy. You can put it on your skin, use it as suntan lotion, cook with it, it's great. Anything coconut's great. Um. How many, I know I'm asking, bulleting these questions, but how many hours before you sleep should you have your last meal? Um, so you'll hear different things about that. It's important to avoid alcohol, I think, in the evening for quality sleep. Um, your body is digesting in that sort of rested state as you sleep. So you don't want to overeat, and I think that's how people misinterpret this advice, but I think it's okay to be eating large meals in the evening or regular meals in the evening. The interesting thing is if you avoid the carbs, You'll see this with the people on keto. They don't need as much food to feel full. And that's one of the reasons they probably are uh, able to eat healthier. Supplements, good or bad? <laughs> so a big study on supplements show that or those- vitamins. Who, yeah, they don't live longer. There's no health benefits to the multivitamin once a day. So it's funny, you have guys like Peter Diamandis, you know, from, uh, I don't know, he's done all sorts of things about modern technology he has like 150 supplements a day or some outrageous number. Does he sell them? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so actually, but I don't know. Yeah, a big randomized trial in the journal, the American Medical Association looked at those on daily multivitamins versus those without long-term follow-up, no difference in health outcomes. Now, if you're deficient in something, certainly you need to, you know, a, a supplement could help. But where do we get these guidelines from? Where do, we, where do we get these rules that say everyone's cholesterol has to be in this range? It's different for every person. It's different for every ethnicity. Well, Dr. Marty McCary, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. The price we pay, what broke American healthcare and how to fix it. Uh, and then your other book, uh, Unaccountable, What Hospitals Won't Tell You and How Transparency Can Revolutionize Healthcare. And I just want to mention the price we pay uh, you went all over the country meeting hospitals, meeting people. There's so much work went into this and, and so much insight. And I really appreciate this conversation. Will you come back on the podcast again? Because I still have probably 50 questions uh, to ask. <laughs> Asking for a friend, right? Uh, Asking for a friend, right? <laughs> um, great to be with you, James. Great to get to know you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks. Appreciate it. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.